Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 96th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. This is going to be a fun one. This week, I'm going to do the most requested interview breakdown yet, which was my conversation with Mr. Thaddeus Russell talking about the postmodern theory of truth. I believe this is episode 80. At the time, we had actually kind of a two-part conversation. The first one ended up being about love, which was very interesting. And then the second part was about truth. And in in this conversation, we kind of referenced the first part. So I highly recommend people go back and listen to both parts one and two. I thought it was a very fascinating conversation. So my general argument in a nutshell is that humans seem to have some limited access to objective truth. We just kind of become aware of the nature of our experiences. I always like to give the example of the ubiquitous philosophical pin, right? So, uh, Really, if I'm being, if I'm speaking honestly, I can say, look, I'm having a certain experience of blackness in my visual field, and that must mean I can say at least one certainly true thing about the entire universe, namely that there is at least the experience of blackness taking place. So even if we disagree about everything else, I can know, I think with certainty, that a black experience exists, and if anybody disagrees with me, I think I'm certain that they're objectively wrong. Now, this is a a radical claim. It's got big implications if that's true, and it's kind of diametrically opposed to the more postmodern approach to theories of truth. So naturally, we have an excellent conversation. All right, let's dive right in. We're going to start at the beginning where I give a little bit of preface, um, and then as we go along, I'll kind of offer additional commentary in hindsight um, that you guys might find interesting. Here we go. So this is a, a natural segue. We, we, I'll give a little bit of preface, um, and then we'll dive right into where I think we will disagree. So where we just ended it is by saying that language seems to be unique to every individual, and our conceptual schemes seem to be unique to every individual. That What I mean by the most elementary of things is going to be sometimes slightly different than what you mean and sometimes radically different. A great example of this is uh, basic objects. So like I have a pin here mm-hmm. and I've done been doing enough philosophy to know that what I actually mean by a pin, what I'm actually referencing is probably radically different what, from what most people understand by that word in the West, because I'm actually talking about my experience. I'm talking about the experience of the color blue in my visual field. I just call it a pin. And most people think that I'm talking about some object out there in the world. Okay, so that's the first point, just a little bit of additional commentary. Right? At the time, I had a blue pen. Now I have a black pen. Um, the point is to say that if you have really, really high standards of skepticism, and you're like, man, I just don't know. I might be hallucinating all of reality. I don't know if there's any such thing as a physical world. Then we can still speak honestly about objects. right? I can't tell you with certainty that there is three-dimensional space and there is an object with such and such property that is located in a three-dimensional space, and that's the thing I'm looking at, because I don't, I don't have access to that knowledge. I can't be certain. I have a theory. Maybe there's some three-dimensional space, but I'm not certain of it. But I am certain of the existence of the experience itself. Like I can tell you a true thing. I am experiencing blackness in my visual field right now. So if we're trying to get access to truth, even if it's a, a non-standard truth, not talking about the status of the three-dimensional world, I'm talking about my own experiences, uh, I think it's important to start with what we can know for certain, which is kind of immediately um, the the content of our experiences, as I like to say. So even something elementary that we we can have like um, practical discourse about, and we both know what I mean by pen for all, you know, practical purposes, can be radically different in terms of philosophy. So um, where I think a lot of people who are postmodernists would agree is with this, uh, like, Uh, You you and I are probably going to agree that language is very vague. It's very imprecise when we're talking about communicating between two people. My concepts are just not going to be your concepts. And if we can make any philosophic progress, you have to understand how imprecise language is. Okay, Uh, one more thing on this. Um, So I I, I start this off by saying I actually agree with some of the some postmodern theory of language. It's interesting, actually, in some of my writing, some people have commented that I sound rather postmodern, which is funny because in other areas, I'm like the complete opposite of postmodern. Um, but where people like objectivists, um, I think, go completely wrong is they don't actually grasp how language works. They think that there are like objective definitions for words. Language doesn't work that way. Um, unfortunately, language doesn't work that way. Things that 
appear much more simple if you think that uh, language correlates to objective definitions. In reality, I think language correlates to the concepts in one's own mind, and that if one is an effective communicator, you can use words in such a way where it elicits concepts in the mind of somebody else that are similar to the concepts in your own mind. But it's uh, maybe never a case of perfect precision that the exact concept you have in your mind is the, the same thing in my mind. Even with things like mathematics, I don't think you can get to perfectly identical, identical concepts arising in the mind of two different people just because their mental structures are going to be completely different kind of um, from birth. Agree? It's not the word I use, um, right, because imprecise, um, uh, you know, obviously implies that there is something that is more precise, which mm -hmm. implies <laughs> that there is a, an external objective standard. Uh, mm -hmm to which a thing can be closer or, or farther from, right? How about, how about imprecision in terms of <clears throat> like the intent behind the communication? So if I want to imply something by my words and I actually imply something else, like in your mind when you hear the words, couldn't that be a kind of imprecision? Intent. I'm not sure. Mm, that's a weird one. Um, I, it doesn't, I don't think this matter. Well, so how about we just agree that we um, that the difference is is that there simply is a difference, whether it's radical or whether it's about intent or, you know, yeah, I agree with you that there is a difference in the way you and I think of that pen. OK, now, the first little interjection I want to make here is notice the claim that I'm not sure if this is important, uh, that that type of claim actually comes out through comes up throughout the interview at interesting times. And I'll just say up, up front, I think I've, I've noticed it's not just with Thaddeus Russell, but with, this is a, this is a normal human thing. Um, I have funny examples. Maybe I'll say it some future time of this recently happening, but, um, when sometimes when having philosophical conversation, if the person you're talking with kind of hits the nail on the head, and uh, is like a direct immediate refutation of everything that you hold dear, <laughs> uh, the reaction, the, the normal human psychological reaction is, is to be like, well, I don't know if that's important or that's an uninteresting question, which is the thing that just happened, re, happened to me recently. It's like, uh, this is, uh, so for example, if, um, if, let's say we're talking with a religious person, somebody that believes very passionately in one particular interpretation of scripture and, you know, hypothetically, let's say you have an argument for like, uh, let's say that the Bible is written by men and it's not written by God. Now, if that's one of the, if they've never entertained that idea, they've never thought about the nature of the Bible being written by humans versus written by God. Um, if they encounter that for the first time, they might go, ooh, that's not an important question. Or, that's a bad question. That's a silly question. And they kind of try to poo-poo it, dismiss it to kind of make it go away. And so I get the impression throughout this conversation, and maybe I'll bring it up as it, as it goes along, as it happens, um, that as we poke around some fundamental ideas regarding the objectivity of truth, uh, we get that type of response. So just keep that in mind as we go along. Okay. So that, that I think is really essential to understanding what I would say is a clear rational philosophy is how uh, difficult sometimes linguistic um, uh, differences between us are. Like if you can have a long conversation and not make any headway because you don't realize you're using a different definition for the sure. same word. Let me, let me just yeah. slightly clarify again. I guess um, I believe that most people you're calling postmodernists would say they would prefer simply to say that there is a difference rather than um, that language is imprecise or okay. vague. Because okay. that's I think that's that's how I read Foucault and Derrida. They simply they point to differences in interpretations, mm -hmm. differences in concepts, differences in language. OK. okay. Um, for, for a, a, a point on that, if you're aware with like where the postmodern theory of truth is going, then this will make a lot of sense. I'm kind of preempting some of the conversation here, but um, to say that there are differences in people's interpretation of the same word is in fact to make a objective claim about the nature of reality, to say that it is the case that X is uh, a statement, a, a positive statement a positive universal statement about how language works and how language relates to minds. So already off the get go, I think that uh, is gives attention with 
the postmodern philosophy because it doesn't want to make any universal claims. But if you say that uh, interpretations of words differ among minds, one has already made um, a universal claim. And I don't exactly see a way around that. Rather, they don't, they just don't say things, something is more vague or less vague okay. or more precise or less precise. That's all. But okay. that's, that's actually important, which we'll probably now unpack. Okay. So, the importance of, yeah. So part two of where I would talk about this pin, I'm saying the contents of my experience, like I'm yeah. talking about blueness in my visual field. However, I also have the belief that I think most people do um, mm -hmm. that aren't relativists that would say there is a kind of correspondence with the, the contents of my experience, with the, the blue pin in my visual field, with some kind of external object. There's a thing out there in the world that is constructed in such a way that when my mind interacts with it, it gives me this experience. Yep. So that's what that's usually like the realm of where we talk about objective truth. There's this objective reality out there. That's right. something I'm very partial to. What do you, what's your position? Yeah, no. Well, no, sorry, I take it back. I've evolved on that. Okay. Um, uh, I don't know if I ever took a hard atheist position, um, but I think I <laughs> tended to talk like I was an atheist on that. Uh, I'm an agnostic. So what I say okay. now is, um, I don't know. Okay. Okay. So, um, I like this. I like also something to keep in mind, um, uh, just an observation. Now, I think Thaddeus often correlates the idea of objective truth with God and not necessarily to his, that's is not necessarily a criticism. So there's actually some really interesting ideas. I forget. I spoke with a, there's a professor in Australia. I, I, I did an interview on this about the, the remarkable claim that uh, there was an objective nature out there outside of our minds that is somehow rationally comprehensible to us. It's almost so beautiful and profound and crazy. It's almost a theological claim. So on the one hand, I do think that there, there might be kind of a knee-jerk, um, I don't want to be religious, I definitely don't want to be sound like Christian or anything like that for whatever reason. Um, I do think it's a bit of a knee-jerk reaction. On the other hand, there, may, there might be some, uh, some deep, deeper truths here that if you acknowledge the existence of rationally comprehensible objective truth, you got some explaining to do that can easily, I think, fall into some type of religious belief. It doesn't necessarily mean like, uh, you know, a denomination of a particular type or, or you believe that holy books are literal or anything like that, but some type of remarkable claim about um, n nature and its relationship with y your finite mind. I don't know. So what is your hesitation to, to, uh, to that kind of idea? Because when we think about theories of physics, for example, they seem to be based on this idea of the external world that operates a certain way. We observe it, and so we come up with theories that describe this external mm -hmm. world. Would you say yeah. that those are all kind of useful and nice, like uh, physical theories, but they're, we have no way of knowing whether or not they're true? Yeah, uh, which is what Einstein said. You know, So he said that, you know, two things cannot occupy the same point in space or time. And so therefore no two things can, can perfectly correspond. And therefore we never know whether our thoughts, our ideas, our words, our concepts perfectly correspond with something else, meaning something outside of consciousness, meaning some objective reality. So, and I've heard other, uh, I cannot vouch for uh, for the Einstein quote, I, it's funny. I, I, I'm I'm listening to this. I kind of scrubbed through it before, but I'm listening to the, this uh, whole thing as I'm recording it now. And um, I tend I tend to be very partial to Einstein. Surprisingly, um, if you guys have been watching for a while, you know I think everybody's wrong about everything all the time, academics and professionals included. Einstein actually has some excellent quotes. Um, and, and on this topic, actually, he was in a a fight in the physics community until the end of his life, where the physics community was saying, ah, there, there is uh, no such thing as observation independent reality. Uh, there's no such thing as like nature out there separate our experiences. And Einstein said, what, that's crazy. Uh, yes, there definitely is. Um, and this is, uh, as a result, the physics profession moved, thought Einstein turned more and more into a crank as he went along. It's a long and convoluted uh, story, but I, I side with Einstein and all the quotes that I've seen of his um, uh, 
uh, are rather good. So I don't know if this one is correct. I don't know if that interpretation is correct. It actually sounds like a quote that you might hear from Niels Bohr, who which kind kind of Einstein's uh, arch nemesis in some respects. But uh, an, a, a, an interesting anecdote nonetheless. Physicists say the same thing. In fact, recently uh, I heard Lawrence Krauss just say this. In fact, on I think Sam Harris's podcast or something. And he 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 said a great thing. I loved it. He said, "Yeah, I, you know, I." This idea about truth, that's not what we do. What we do is we disprove things. What scientists do is disprove things. We never prove anything. Mm -hmm. but, but he said, I couldn't get out of bed in the morning if I didn't believe in objective truth. Mm. Oh, uh, my comment is that I think Lawrence Krauss is a, is a fool. Um, he's just a popularizer of, of science. He's like, he's like a science bro. Um, uh, he's got logical contradictions in his work about nothing is something because he treats n uh, empty three-dimensional space as nothing, which is a logical contradiction. Um, he's also got he's also famous for saying that two plus two equals five in some certain circumstances for for extremely large magnitudes of two. Um, I think he's a, I, I think he's just kind of largely a fraud. Um, and it's I, and I, though uh, I wish other scientists actually had the idea that they weren't proving things. Go ahead to go talk to scientists, go talk to mathematicians and see if they think they're proving things. They definitely think they're proving things, which is why they're so vociferously opposed to anybody that claims um, they're wrong about some of their fundamental ideas. Um, which I thought was a great, really honest, um, I don't know, acknowledgement of a conceit, I suppose, that it's at the base of a lot of scientific inquiry. I don't think it's necessary. I think you can still operate as a scientist without that belief. But um, I do think that has driven a lot of science, what we call scientific work. Mm. Yeah. So what do you think about well, uh, uh, to, to his credit, I think there's some truth to that, which is what that uh, guy and that scientist in Australia was saying is, in fact, the belief in the objective, rationally comprehensible universe has tended to be a religious one and has driven quite a lot of scientific and mathematical um, thinking. That is true. I don't think that means the ideas are wrong, but th th what, he said, what he just said there is true. Um, propositions that make claims about the contents of our consciousness. So if we're not talking about, let's say, the physical external world that we don't really have a direct engagement with because we're kind of, we, we engage with what we experience, which is the contents of our consciousness, can't we say true and false things about what's going on in our minds? Um. We, what do you mean? Can we? I don't. Sure, I don't. You can say whatever you want. I don't know if any of our if if any of my own claims about my own consciousness are true. Right. All right. So this is where we start to diverge. So um, it's one thing to say that we cannot have certainty about the mind independent world, and that's I think that's ninety eight percent true. Um, you can't actually say logically certain things about all of existence, like it is however it is, when you get into that later. But I'm actually, I like the skepticism of the postmoderns to a point, right? But when you claim I can't have, I don't know the contents of my own experience, that's an entirely different beast. In, in fact, I think that you can, you, you actually have direct access to the contents of your experience. You may mislabel them or you may misconceptualize them in some way, but uh, maybe prior to the conceptualization or the articulation of the things you're experiencing, you actually are experiencing things exactly the way that they are in your experience. The, the appearances of things as they appear to you are their, experience, are, are their appearances and you have access to them. This is very important. Oops. Is that asking? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Again, an agnostic position. So, if so, from my perspective, right? If I'm if I'm having the blueness experience, yeah. could I not say it is the case that I am having the experience of blue? I don't know what's causing it. It, it might be a hallucination, but that it is taking place is definitely the case. I, you can again, you can say whatever you want. I don't know. I just simply do not know whether what you are saying has any relationship to an external truth or reality. Well, okay, so. So there's a there's a switch here, right? I'm 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 saying, and I continue to say through the interview, that there is a fact of my own experience, which I am reporting on. My internal experience is of a particular type, and I'm saying that it is that way. And he, and I want that that fact to be acknowledged. And then he says, well, 
I'm not sure if that correlates to some consciousness independent state, but that's not the claim. The claim isn't the consciousness independent state necessarily, at least not at the beginning. The conscious, the, the claim is simply, is it true that my, my, I can have access to the real nature of my own experiences? Are they the way that they are? But, but it depends on what you mean by external. So, okay. so, I, so could you make a claim about kind of your, in, and I don't mean to, to can as in like, do you have permission to, to make mm -hmm. these claims? I mean, from your perspective, is it possible to make an accurate description, an accurate conceptual description of the phenomena that you are experiencing? It might be. <laughs> okay, Sorry, so, I so, know. <laughs> no, but, okay, well, but hang yeah. on. So, so how could I be wrong? So for, I'll take from my perspective, I know we're two different minds, so we're going to have two different perspectives, but you, you can mm -hmm. imagine if you were doing this yourself, you know, blueness is taking place in my visual field. How could that possibly be wrong? Blueness is taking place in my visual field. I'm just reporting on my experience. I don't know that it can be wrong. <laughs> uh, uh, <clears throat> so I like, well, I'll start with a compliment is that I like the skepticism. I mean, you're talking, you know, this is a guy, this is me, a guy who has so much skepticism that I actually think Euclid was wrong, right? As an aside, you know, um, Euclid is this old Greek geometer that created Euclidean geometry. And he had, I don't know, what was it, seven axioms, six axioms, something like that. And then he builds his beautiful structure of knowledge. And, you know, in hindsight, one of the axioms, the parallel postulate, um, came into doubt over, it took like 2,000 years. People were like, you know what, this is definitely um, doubtable, coherently doubtable. So <clears throat> there's one level of skepticism which you doubt the parallel postulate. Then there's my level of skepticism, which is doubting all of the other postulates. <laughs> They're about like rotation and stuff because I think space is actually discrete. I, I'm the only person I think I've ever met who disagrees with like the first, I don't know, five axioms <laughs> of Euclidean geometry. So I love the skepticism, but you get skepticism has to be uh, tempered, right? Skepticism has to, you have to be skeptical of your own skepticism. It has to be an open question whether or not you can have access to certain truth. Um, so to say, I don't know whether or not I can make a mistake about my conceptualizing of my experiences is good, but that shouldn't be where the end of the inquiry is. It's fine not to know. Like I didn't know for a while whether or not there could be logical contradictions, but now I do. And, and this is information you can have you can have access to and, and knowledge about. Like maybe, so let's see, where's my, where'd my pen go? Here's my black pen. So there, at time one, I might think to myself, well, maybe I'm not experiencing blackness in my visual field. That's fine. But keep thinking about it. Keep meditating. Eventually, you'll come, I think, to the conclusion that, no, actually, even if I'm confused about how this experience correlates to the external world, even if I'm hallucinating, even if I'm schizophrenic, even if there are no other minds, there is at least the experience of blackness in my visual field right now. This is a kind of certain truth. Well, if so, but if you don't know if it could be right, that would mean it has to, you have to have a possibility of it being wrong. Because if it didn't have the possibility of being wrong, that means it would definitely be right. Possibility to be wrong, possibility to be right. Is there a possible, is there a possible truth? Um, okay, there might be. I don't know. That's all I got for you. See, the but, thing is, but when you say okay. it might be, it implies it could be this way or it could be that way. So, so I, I think it's fine to say it could be the case that there is indeed blueness in your visual field. That could be the case. But to say it could be that there isn't blueness in your visual field. Well, that's not true because I'm directly experiencing them, whether or not there's blueness in my visual field. Uh, I, I'm, I'm missing. I'm not. I'm missing something here. Now, I don't know if that's true. I, I, I think what, what he just said there at the end, I, that he's missing something. Th this, I have the suspicion. I, I can't say with confidence, but I have the suspicion this is one of the psychological things I mentioned earlier. That this is so on the nose. Like, if you acknowledge that, it is certainly the case that you can correctly identify phenomena in your visual field as they are. Um, then I don't think you get the rest of the theory, postmodern theory of truth. And, it, and if some part of your psychological structure or full of formal philosophy or you know, life that you built for yourself is based on the presupposition that you can't have access to that type of knowledge, then I think, the, I think you're going to see a kind of short-circuiting of the 
of the thinking process. Like accidentally, I don't know if he's doing this intentionally or, or not, but I, I, I get the impression this is a short circuiting. Like how, how could it be that one truly does not know whether or not there is an experience of a particular type taking place? Doesn't matter. If, like I said, if it's a hallucination, it still is the way that it appears to you, the experience itself. Um, so when someone says there is a God, I say, maybe, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then when an atheist says there is no God, I say, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. Right. Uh, what okay. Also, I think just a side note, it's interesting that in the abstract, this is a cool thing I think that's going on is there's, there's the, equ the equating of claims ab about truth in one's experience with the existence of God. We go right back to the religion thing where it's like, well, if I claim this, then I'm like the person, I'm like the religious person claiming that they know that God exists because of a type of experience. I don't want to be that type of person. Therefore, I'm going to say, I don't know. What's wrong there? Okay. What am I, so, what am I, what am I admitting? So the difference <laughs> is that when uh -huh. you're talking about God, you're talking about some external phenomena. You're like positing some mind independent entity out there. That's, right. the, I don't I think that's the way to go. But I'm, I'm saying I am, re all I'm doing is reporting on the contents of my experience. So I'm not saying there is a God, there isn't a God. I'm saying it is oh. the case that experience is happening a particular way. Oh, Oh, does your experience exist? Does your consciousness okay. exist? Okay, is that that, what you're uh, that's or, that's not what I'm saying, but that's a good question. <laughs> so, so, thought, so uh -huh. what, how would you answer that? Is, does your consciousness exist? Yeah, I mean, man, I'm totally f fine answering this, and it doesn't it doesn't bother me or challenge me at all. I just think it's not that useful, but whatever. Beep beep, not that useful. Um, Yes, I there. Yeah, I guess I'm still an agnostic. Like, I don't know, like, it could be this thing that I might consider consciousness is could be something else. It could but, be. But it is it is conscious at the very least, even if it's like, halluc even if you're hallucinating, it still is experiential <laughs> in nature, right? Oh, I, oh, I see. So it's consciousness because it's con because we're conscious. Like, well, that's, a, that's, a, it, well, self, but, that's a tautology. Right? Mm, 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 mm. Uh, so I, I think something that happens maybe in um, the postmodern philosophy proper, not just um, Thaddeus, uh, Thaddeus's philosophy, but I think what happens is people get trapped up in language. So, so they, right, there's, the, I forget, somebody said that there's nothing, there's no outside text. Uh, the idea is like, oh, if you say consciousness is consciousness, that's just an empty tautology, which is an importing an idea from logical positivism, but never mind that point. Um, tautologies can't tell you anything, and therefore it's just kind of silly. I can't, like, I can't label my consciousness anything because consciousness is consciousness, A is A, I mean, it doesn't really tell anything. But really, that's, I think that's a confusion about language. It's like, there is an experience taking place. It doesn't matter the words you put on it. It doesn't even matter if you communicate with anybody. There's something that's happening that uh, I have direct access to. It doesn't matter if it's a hallucination, but it definitely exists. It's definitely going on. If there's anything whatsoever, there is my direct experiences. That is definitely something that is part of the entirety of the universe. But it's, see, I, I think people, I think people give tautologies a bad rap. There are a few tautologies which I think are, <laughs> are pretty interesting, but that, this wouldn't be one. This is just a way okay. we use the word consciousness to describe something that's happening. So mm -hmm. it's okay, we can use another word, but when you introspect, I, I, you understand English, most people mean by the English word experience. I, I'm guessing we have a, a shared uh, experience. I don't know that's the case, but when I introspect, there is perception taking place. There is consciousness, you could call it that, the experience that is going on. Or there are colors, for example, that are moving in my visual field is the way that I describe it. Right. So to prove that there that consciousness exists, you then use words like um, introspection and experience. There's and no, I'm not proving that consciousness exists. Oh. By, by so you see, this is the other thing about language, right? And this is the this is the this implies this is like an external game, a language game that we're playing between two people. This is not the function of it doesn't need to be the function of language. Sometimes language can serve that purpose, but not all the time, right? It's not I am here's a theory, consciousness exists. Here's my proof, blah, 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 blah. That's not what's going on. It, it, I'm a, it is a statement of fact. It is the case that experience is taking place. I am reporting it to whomever can listen. Argument. Uh, oh. that's, that would be that would be backwards. That would be 
Yeah, I, the there's. I'm saying when you meditate on your experience, like if you're aware <laughs> of your experience, is it the case that you can be aware of something taking place? Like there is something. It is not the case that there is only nothing. To which I say it's possible, but I don't know. And to which you say. To which I say, it, when you say it's possible, that implies there's a possibility of being A or a possibility of being B, right? So when you say it's possible, what, whether or not there's consciousness, you're saying it is a possible case that there is no conscious phenomena taking place. Like maybe that's going on. No, but you're, you're positing the binary, yes or no. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not positing a binary. I'm just, I don't know. Do you think I don't know is not to say that there's an A or B or yes or no. Well, what it's does just, I don't know mean? So you're positing, if someone were to posit A, God exists, or that pen, or your, or your consciousness is a thing, is, <laughs> is a true thing, um, and I say I don't know, that doesn't posit that there are, that there are two, or only one alternative. What, what does I don't know mean? So would you say I don't okay. know doesn't mean it could be X, it could be not X? <laughs> I don't know where you're going with it. I don't. Oh, there it is again. There's this, a little slip. I don't know where you're going with it. This is important. I don't know. Uh, I think it's rather clear, right? That the uh, when one says I don't know, how I understand I don't know it, that to mean is it, it could be the case that X is true, and it could not be the case that X is true, or it could be the case that X is not true. Right. I'm not. Um... I'm having a hard time finding this fruitful, or maybe I'm missing something here. Uh, having a hard time finding it fruitful? Wow, what? This is central. This is it. I, yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> there, it could exist. It could not exist. There could be yet another category. Uh, there could be no categories, I guess is what I want to say. Maybe that's what you're driving at, um, okay. or, or that's what you want. Okay. Or that's the, that's the only real answer to what you're saying. Um, that there are no categories. That's another possibility. If there, so let's say there are no categories, because I think it, you could might even be able to say that. Like you know, you could come up with a coherent worldview. I think that would say there's no categories, but that doesn't mean existence. There's there still is something, right? Even if if you're just purely if it, uh, awareness, for example, awareness uh -huh. is a word that describes something that is, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Well, okay. So awareness is a word which, and we attach, we have attached meanings to it. Those meanings are made up of other words, which are defined by other words, which are all part of the same language. If, so it's a, if, and there, and, and when the same, so it's all circular, it all circulates within the same language. So, so I think it's to kind of a, um, a good and fundamental part of the philosophy of language here that I think can trip a lot of people up. That there's an idea that words come attached to definitions themselves, or like there's, or perhaps I should phrase it this way. This idea that he's articulating about the philosophy of language denies that there is a correspondence between internal meaning and the external word choice, right? When, when one says, ah, I, I use this word. And then somebody responds, ah, oh, well, the definition of that word is such and such and such and such. That's implying it's like an external thing. Um, if you think that's the only thing that exists, you're trapped in language, right? Because you, you'll find that words are defined by other 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 words, and it's just this big circular mush. That's one philosophy. I think that's wrong. The way that words actually work is that they correspond to internal mental states. So a meaning of a word is not its definition. That's the people that the people that think words are objective think that. No, the meaning of a word is what I mean by it, by my word. The, the, you know, so I, so let's say I didn't know the English. Let's say I didn't uh, um, speak English, and and I was talking to somebody in English. I have like a, there's a there's a meaning of this thing that I'm referencing, like this object here in this way. Just because I don't have the word doesn't mean that the meaning's not there. And I'm fortunate if I speak the same language, I can choose the word out of the ether that corresponds, you know, if we're speaking the same language with uh, the same general concept in your mind. That's how the, that's the, that's, that's the grounding of uh, uh, language into meaning rather than language into other language. 
structure. This is Derrida and deconstructionism, okay? And nothing, there's nothing outside of that system. But you can't ever show that any one word in that system okay. is closer to something outside of well, it. See, see, you can't show that by language. I think that's true. I mean, uh, half true, right? The important part is there is something outside the language, namely the me meaning. <laughs> what you mean, your personal consciousness, your internal state, which is the thing that the word corresponds to. It's not just the word itself somehow in isolation. Well, there's, there's two things on that. One, okay. that implies that words are necessarily about communication. And I don't think that needs to be the case. It could be the case that, for example, the only thing that exists is your awareness. Mm -hmm. And you just come up with words to talk to yourself. You could do it that way. That would be the case. But if that's true, you still have awareness. But, mm -hmm. And two, is it the case then that at least words exist? Like that is a something. That's a clever question. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh. But do words exist? If everything is, you're stuck in language, you're trapped in words, well, do the words exist? Now, I think the reason he says, I don't know, is it's something like, I think you can interpret that as, it must be that I don't know, or it must be that I couldn't know, or I couldn't know, therefore I don't know. I think that's actually the, the, the idea that is being communicated here. Because if it would be the case that you can know words exist, the whole paradigm collapses and suddenly you have access to objective truth. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. So, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I guess, is this, I'm trying to get at what your, there's a, your, your, there's a strategy here, which is fine. I'm just wondering what you're driving at. Like, what do you, I think that is, uh, another version of, of like a psychological tick where, where we go from from the ideas to, well, what about your motivation? You know, what, what is the reason you're actually doing this? What are you trying to achieve by this conversation? Um, this is also related to, I think, postmodern theory of power, that really what's going on, like when we're having this discussion is some kind of exchange of power and there's some kind of manipulation going on. And I think, I think two things on that. First of all, I think it's mostly true in the world. I do think that, uh, I learned this the hard way actually rather recently, um, but I, it took me a long time to realize that most people don't communicate in order to try to exchange information or to try to get at the truth. Most people in the world, I think, talk in order to manipulate you or to, to, to put their place in some kind of a social hierarchy, to quack and figure out um, their, their social status and all of that. And, I, and one can imagine how this would be, this would, if one didn't understand this information, how it'd be difficult to navigate the world because I, here I am flapping my mouth trying to communicate information and everybody else is playing a power game. So on the one hand, I think, I think if you want an explanation for the, how the world of mankind works, I think focusing on power and manipulation is good. On the other hand, there is an exception. Uh, there, are, there are a few exceptions. There are people who are seriously interested in the pursuit of truth and aren't trying to manipulate somebody else. I would consider myself one of them, and I, I hope I communicated that. I think Thaddeus actually got that impression that, like, I'm actually not trying to communicate. With, uh, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not trying to manipulate you. Like, if I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. You know, show me why I'm wrong. And if you're wrong, I'll try to do the same. I'll try to, I'll, I'll try to share with you the ideas that persuaded me to see if you, they persuade you. And it's not manipulation. Um, so, yeah. I think to treat it as entirely 100% in all cases, language is about manipulation, is, a, is an overly pessimistic um, way of understanding how language works. You're trying to establish something, right? No, uh, the, this oh. is the, the strategy is to have this conversation about the objectivity of truth. This, is, this it, idea is, I think, what the, um, the Jordan Petersons of the world find sinister you know when they when they look at the postmodernist or they look at what they mean by postmodernist yeah. uh, they, this is what i think they say ah, this nugget here mm -hmm. that we can't even say that awareness is happening or that we can't mm -hmm. like, that's disingenuous or it's not true or it's bad so i think it's 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 central no no i know i know that's the question we're dealing with you it sounds to me like your answer to that is yes there is truth and here's here's where it is it's in something you're calling awareness or consciousness? Uh, the existence no. of? I'm asking you questions if you admit the existence of the contents of your own consciousness. If that's the case, then yeah, there are other things we, that we could say. But we, uh, 
because it, it's a natural step to say if it's the case that there is consciousness then at the very least that's truth so the contents of your consciousness taking place however they're taking place that is something that is the way that it is and it isn't some other way it's truth um no i really don't know uh i could be schizophrenic so that interesting claim right right so so I think, I think again, from the outside, what's going on is there is a conclusion in mind. And this is a kind of, okay, so you, if you start with the conclusion that truth is not discoverable, and you, and you encounter the idea that I've just made, then you'd be like, well, truth isn't discoverable, so like maybe I'm schizophrenic. I think that's actually where you get that type of response. I think it's, a, it's in, inter an interesting data point in, in one's worldview to respond to say, well, you know, maybe I could be schizophrenic because because I also think it implies um, not carefully listening to the ideas. I think I, I hope I hope I respond. If I don't respond properly, I'll I'll make sure to respond properly uh, in this commentary. One alternative, but, but okay. Why, but that wouldn't invalidate the idea of your awareness. Right, it might exactly. just be that your awareness is schizophrenic in nature. Exactly. You, that, oh, that, that I have awareness. Whether I have awareness yeah, yeah, is the question. Yeah. Yeah. Whether I have awareness. Yeah, I don't know because. The, yeah, this has gotten to the level of abstraction that I find actually um, uh, borders on obscurantism. I don't know if this is even helpful. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that that line is the craziest. I'm sorry. Uh, forgive me, Thaddeus. Um, that is not true. Uh, let me tell you why. There is literally nothing more concrete in the entire universe than our experiences. So the way that theorizing about the world works is something as basic as like ordinary objects. There is a pin that takes up three-dimensional space. This is abstract. Like the world outside of my experiences is necessarily abstract. This is something that Bernardo Castro actually was really good um, in, in explaining that the world out there, the world I do not directly experience is the world of the abstract. The most concrete thing that we have that, that is to us, is the nature of our experiences. It is the, the specific qualitative phenomenological texture of our experiences. That is literally concreteness is what we experience. Nothing is more concrete than it. It's direct. It's certain. Um, so to say that we've reached a level of abstraction in which it's getting to obscurantism is the opposite of the truth. That's literally the opposite. Uh, that there is nothing more concrete or, or, or less obscure than referencing the texture of your own conscious experience. And, and, and again, I suspect this is, does not come from rational deliberation in concluding this. I think, I think this is, I think this is something, I think, yeah, actually you're seeing something like the unity of opposites, let's say. It's something so clear, so concrete, so demonstrable, so, so like right there, right in front of your face, that the only way to uh, reconcile with it and not completely change your worldview is by claiming the opposite must be true. So it's like the most concrete thing, which is the nature of your own experiences. Well, it couldn't be that that's the most concrete thing. So it's got to be that that is the most abstract thing that like, pff, I can't even, I can't even grasp it. It's like obscure. Um, that's my guess is what's taking place. And I say this because experience, right? I've been in, like I grew up religious and for a long time, I held those religious beliefs. I've experienced these type of psychological things before. Your, your, your mind plays tricks on you to try to keep together your worldview. And this is just what it looks like, I think, from the outside. Um, but it is because there's so many people that there's so many people that will take the, uh, these ideas and run with them in either direction because there are people that are going to say, I can't really answer that question because it's too abstract and I'm not going to deal with questions of truth. There are other people like myself who would say, ah, there is actually truth to be discovered right here. This mm -hmm. is where you can discover truth, even if it's obscure or abstract. And then we can build a somewhat of a structure of knowledge based on some things that we can discover about our own awareness. I'm, it's funny that I, I think I was being polite there um, uh, because to, to say, oh, yes, well, yeah, I think that's actually what's going on is it's like, oh, yes, well, okay, yeah, I will call it abstract if you want to use that word, but, but keep examining it and see if we can find truth there because the reality is it's not abstract at all. It is, 
You, you could imagine a creature that has no abstraction. What is the, the, the nature of that creature? It's pure perception with no abstraction whatsoever, no ability for pattern recognition, which is an abstract thing. Like the, the living conscious creature sans abstraction is the creature that is pure experience and no understanding. Yeah, so my answer was originally and still is, I don't know. And so what am I admitting by saying that? Okay, so that's what I was asking you. So when you say, I don't know, what I, what I, what I think most people mean by that is, so let's say I claim proposition X. Say, X mm -hmm. is true. And I ask you, do you think X is true? When people say, I don't know, that means it, it could be the case that X is true mm -hmm. or it could not be the case that X is true. And I don't mm -hmm. have a position. Like, I don't yep. have a, is that what you mean? Yep. Okay. So what I'm saying is if that is the dichotomy, it could be mm -hmm. or it could not be, then that implies something could not be. So like if I'm talking about consciousness, you're saying, well, whether or not there is awareness is a matter of maybe there is, maybe there isn't, which means maybe it's possible that in some way there isn't awareness. So, so that's what I'm saying. When you say, I don't know if there's awareness, you're saying it might be the case that there isn't awareness. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So, right. And again, I don't know. And um, what you can do, I suppose, in answer to this Okay, what a postmodernist would do, <laughs> what Foucault definitely would do, what Derrida would definitely do, is simply trace the genealogy, the history of those words and those concepts that you're using in having this dis discussion and asking those questions. Thus, people are misled by Foucault and Derrida because this is the wrong question to ask. You say, what is consciousness? to get out the dictionary and to get out the history books and say, let me tell you about the word consciousness is not to get at the nature of consciousness. Consciousness is the underlying experience, not the word consciousness or the word experience. So awareness, what does that mean? What has its meaning been? And you can actually trace it. You can show how people have thought about it over the years and how it's changed and where it started. What people have thought about it though. I care well, about for me, my consciousness or my awareness my mind having access to correct information and yeah. whether or not it's encoded in a particular language, I don't really care. If I could communicate it to anybody else, I don't really care. I just want to know for myself. But if, but if it turns out that it's historical, meaning social, meaning created by human beings. This is a confusion about language and the world. So uh, this is interesting. Actually, I, I picked up on this, uh, just listening to here. I don't know think I picked this, picked up on this line of reasoning last time. So I think the claim is that, oh, this is fascinating. So I think the claim is that <laughs> what is, this is interesting, what is consciousness? Postmodern answer. Consciousness is a word, and a word has history. It turns out in that word's history, you'll find its definition changes, its meaning changes. It itself, the word, is a social construct. Therefore, consciousness is a social construct. Fascinating. Uh, again, the response to this is there is a difference between the word consciousness and what consciousness refers to. So what, what consciousness refers to is not a social construction in the, sense, in the sense that it's not fundamental, it's not taking place, it's not concrete, it's not happening right now. No, it's the, th the word consciousness is a convention. The thing that's happening right now is not a convention. Right? Then... It invalidates any truth claim you make about it. But that's not, that wouldn't be the case. So let's say it's the case that awareness is something that's somehow socially constructed. Wouldn't, mm -hmm. wouldn't make a difference of whether or not it exists. It would still exist. Okay, I take it back. It doesn't invalidate it, but it certainly challenges it, doesn't it? And no, it, more not importantly... It's, not it's, it's, not, that's hard to say. Not its existence, even if it's socially but, constructed, so what? Right, but again, so okay, more importantly, I guess for my purposes, it makes it impossible to answer the question satisfactorily because again i would ask what do you mean by awareness what do you mean by consciousness right and so and those words have been used in infinite ways interesting fascinating so i wonder could i say so perhaps this is the explanation actually of postmodernism uh as understood by at least people like jordan peterson whether or not it's postmodernism proper is not really relevant um so maybe the claim is that when, when, one only, <clears throat> when one only looks at words and one does not look at what words refer to, 
one will find that the words have a social history. The word's meaning is a social construction. Uh, and therefore, that's all that there is. There's nothing, if there's nothing outside the text and words change over time, then reality changes over time. It was, it was socially constructed in the first place. There's nothing concrete by George. That is, uh, I think that's incorrect, um, but I think that's actually what's going on here. That, that, that way of thinking actually puts quite a lot of other ideas in context, not just with, uh, with Mr. Russell, but with a lot of other um, modernists who I've spoken with. Okay, but so I don't know exactly what you mean. So there is no exact. So there's meaning. a there's like a there's a appeal to the public nature of language here, which is that well, if we can't really have precise communication, we can't really have precise thought. I disagree with that. I'm saying I don't really care if we can't communicate precisely. I have a meaning in my mm -hmm. conceptual scheme. What I mean mm -hmm. by perception. And based on my conversations with most people, I think most people mean the same thing. Like if I, uh, let's say I poke somebody with a needle and I say, oh, that hurts. I, I have a theory which says, okay, they have an internal experience as well. They generally use the same language. So mm -hmm. that's all I'm doing in this conversation is saying, is it the case that for the individual, you can have some access to truth, the way that things are in the world, simply by being aware that your awareness is happening? that your perception is happening, your consciousness is happening. Even if you can't communicate it to anybody, you can still know that it's taking place. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know how that advances the ball at all here on the question. I, I... Wouldn't it be truth? I mean, gosh, that would be a discovery of truth. That's, again, interesting. I don't know how that would advance the ball. Well, that's, that's the, the question. That is the central question. You know, can we have access to objective truth? I don't know. Let's investigate. Is this an example of objective truth? I don't know how that would further the discussion. Well, it's the central point. It could be more no, exciting. No. Oh, it would if I said, yes, that's true, but I don't. I say, I don't know. Yeah, but you, <laughs> you think... said you don't know why it, like, why it's important or what it gets at. And that, that it's, that's oh. like a goal in itself. Wow. True. Okay. Well, fine. I'm just still an agnostic on it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. That's my answer to every question, you know, <laughs> on this. I don't, I don't know. And so you haven't, you haven't gotten okay. me any farther. Okay. So, so, so what yeah. if. So what do you think about this idea? Because this is kind of mm -hmm. my, pers my perspective on it, and I want to know your thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's the case that there is uh, experience happening, that, there, that I, when I use the words, the contents of my perception, I'm actually talking about things that are, so blueness in my visual field actually references something mm -hmm. in my mind. Mm -hmm. And the way that I know that is just through being aware of my experience. Like, it is the case because there it is. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's like a self-evident truth, mm -hmm. even if I can't encode it in, in a way that other people understand. This is self-evident truth. Um, and if somebody were to say, as I think you are, that I don't know if self-evident truths exist, essentially, or that if they are self-evident, it's kind of, um, it's almost like leading a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. It's like, my claim is, I'm not trying to persuade you that this is the case. I'm just saying, look, I think you can have an experience, like maybe like the love experience. I think you can have an experience of a nature in which you will also conclude, I must have some access to truth because I am aware that some, something blue exists in my visual field. Very, 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 very important. And you know, in listening to this, I think postmodernist actual arch enemy is objectivist, like Ayn Randian objectivist, because I've argued with them about language and probably would sound like I'm arguing for Thaddeus's position here. Um, because I think what Thaddeus is correct in identifying, or maybe the postmodernists in general, is that there isn't objective definitions. Therefore, that must have an implication on the accuracy of our communication. But it also misses the philosophical important point that, okay, well, what about truths that are without communication to another? Like, what about tr truths for myself? I don't care if maybe I'm incapable of using words that perfectly reconstruct the concept in my mind into your mind. Okay, but that doesn't mean I personally can't have access to these certain truths myself, which is critically important. Blueness is happening. Yeah. Is this, is this your your riff on uh, Cartesianism, basically? Like, I think, therefore I am. Is it kind of your version of this? Uh, yeah, I, I guess the, the 
the necessariness of awareness, sure. That I don't like the Cartesian uh, cogito because it implies I exist, and then you have to try to define what I is. But if you just okay. say experience is happening, you don't even have to define that. Uh huh. Uh, and if you find this interesting, you can find a, a comparable paragraph in Square One: The Foundations of Knowledge, which is my first book on philosophy. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's the onus. So but you every can know. You can know, though. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying you can know. I might <laughs> not want... be able to persuade you. No, no, Steve, Steve, yeah. here's the thing. You want me to know. No, 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 no. Uh, why been... are you... So what, a, what a turn, right? This is a, such an interesting turn that this happens. This is not unique to, to Thaddeus, where now suddenly it's not about the ideas. Now it's about my motivation. Now it's about the, now it's about the power, the power relationship. Okay, anecdotal story. I probably have said this before, but it just popped in my mind. So... Uh, Many years ago, I was in Washington, D.C. for a, I did a, a, a semester-long program in D.C. I, my alma mater was in upstate New York, and they sent me to D.C. Um, it was like a, the idea is you get an, an internship somewhere in D.C., and then you go to this, these classes at American University. My internship was with Ron Paul, which was pretty amazing. I was a lucky kid. Um, and the, uh, the, semester of curriculum at American University was a total joke. It was just ridiculous. Um, one of the professors, I forget her name now, um, she was a huge fan of Foucault, and she was from somewhere in New Jersey. And I'll never forget, um, she was always talking about the power structures. We would talk, we'd talk about anything once in every talk about how frogs hop and like the mechanics of waves and the ocean. Well, let me tell you about the power structures of the entities involved. And so whenever I hear, you know, people... People t turn conversations to questions of motivation and power. I always think of this lady from New Jersey talking about the power structures. And that's just a silly aside. Why are you bothering with this? Love, Otherwise, I'd love my yeah. friend. <laughs> See, that's it. That's, that's it. No, for real. I know. That's, that's it. No, totally. I agree with you it on is, that. It, um, is, it is. Okay. So, so uh, if that doesn't make sense, then you guys need to listen to our earlier conversation. There's actually a rather profound point here, though, which is that uh, for me personally, I do think it's an, it is an act of love to try to discover truth with people. So for me, like I am on the pursuit of truth. It's just burned into my being. And there is a limited amount of people out there who are also pursuing truth explicitly. But I think most people, even, uh, ha, even if they don't know it consciously, have an in, implicit pursuit of truth. To, to, so to share philosophy and to share ideas that I find persuasive, really the secret is that it is actually an act of love. Like it is my way of showing love to Thaddeus Russell that, hey, look, I think I found truth. And as a fellow human, I think you should hear these arguments because you might be persuaded by them as well. And once you walk down the path of discovering truth, it leads to other, other, other big things that are, uh, that are really important. So you got me. I, I do have, I think, an underlying motivation, which is to show love through uh, the pursuit of truth. It is a kind of human peership that I've discovered something which I found exciting, which is that yeah. I do have access to some kind of limited set of truths about the ah. contents of my consciousness. I and so it. I am I'm freely sharing it with you. <laughs> I love it. OK, <laughs> here's your problem, my friend. Okay. I th you know, so you're the apple hasn't fallen too far from the tree, it turns out, I <laughs> which is that, you know, um, when the missionary went to Peru and stood in the jungle looking at the Indians there and said, God is real. And they said, no, he's not. It, our God is real. Yeah. Then they're engaged, right? They're locked in this struggle between this and that. There's this binary opposition going on, which becomes co-constitutive, right? They, can, they constitute each other. We are good, which is the opposite of them, and mm -hmm. we, right? And then it's a fight, and they're both trying to win over the other, and they're both really worried, and they both are concerned about the other. I don't mm. care. If the, if the Indians had said, I don't know if your God exists, right? Then, then it's just up to the missionary whether he uh, pulls out the guns, right? All right, so I'm going to theorize here. I'm going to say this is Thaddeus is revealing his attempt at love. So I think this is really interesting that... Rather than saying, I have access to objective truth, one pretends not to have access to objective truth or puts oneself in a state of confusion and agnosticism, perhaps for the goal of peace, because he sees 
what has happened when two people claim to have objective truth, they fight and they kill each other. He's, he's deemed that bad. And so perhaps this is part of the motivation is like a look, maybe if we just get rid of this whole truth thing, just eject it out the window, maybe we'll all be more loving and more kind and there will be less fighting. So, um, I think that's rather sweet. Uh, I also think it's rather dangerous because I, I think, uh, well, there's lots of reasons I won't go into another monologue, but uh, this, this, might be, this might be part of Thaddeus' motivation a as an explanation for um, why the insistent agnosticism. Also, um, notice the reference to religion again, that there's a kind of fundamental, I think, knee-jerk um, reaction for religion, that he thinks, I either one of two things, either... Um, one should not make claims that religious people make because it's unfashionable and religious people we all know are silly, so let's not be like them. Or it might be one should not make religious claims because it lends, it tends towards violence and, uh, and, and, and groups and group conflict, you might say. So interesting. Cause he can't convince them. The onus is on, the person who makes the truth claim. It's not on us. It's not on the relatives. But, but, you're, but you're again taking it from a public perspective. I'm not, screw the evangelists, screw the, the missionaries, good riddance. I'm just saying, hey friend, I, I have meditated <laughs> yeah. and I've become aware that there are things taking place in my visual field. <laughs> and I'm guessing. <laughs> what a great sentence. Hey friend, I've meditated and become aware that there are things taking place in my visual field. Signed Steve. <laughs> Yeah, philosophy. Every once in a while, you get an absurd sentence that arises from philosophical discussion. <laughs> That's one of them. Because I think you're another conscious being that if you are aware, if you, you've got a white shirt on, so I would say if you do this thing with your head where you look down, you will have an experience of a certain nature. Wow. That's all. <laughs> and to say you don't know, and my response is not, well, I'm not going to persuade you. I'm just going to, like, you can know. All you have to do is be aware. It Okay, does it does it give me access? Are you claiming that it gives me access to a universal truth? Ah, uh, that would be part two. <laughs> mm. Mm, mm, mm. See, this is interesting. Okay, are you telling me it gives me access to a universal truth? So the answer is that uh, yes, but not immediately. So part one is, can I be aware of the things happening in my visual field? Part two is you simply turn that truth into a universal claim. So it is true that there is at least one instance of the experience of X taking place in the universe, which is in fact a universal claim. Now, but notice, I think this question goes out of order. I think what Darius is asking is, okay, well, I want to agree that consciousness is happening, like I'm experiencing things, some things of a certain nature, but he doesn't want the conclusion to be, and I have access to objective truth. So... And so if this is, so in other words, if this is where we're going, I'm not going to agree with your premises. I think that's what's happening here. So here, here's why, here's why. In okay. the most limited of senses, and this is where people go uh, crazy, they become dogmatic rationalists. My position is that you, the truths that you can get access to immediately are within the contents of your experience. Mm -hmm. And you can have some extremely abstract truths about the nature of logic by meditating mm -hmm. on the nature of your experiences. Something like, yeah. for example, the blueness in my visual field is the way that it is. Mm -hmm. And the blueness in my visual field is not the way that it is not. So there's like a yeah. white part here and a blue part here. The blue part is not the white part. The white part is not the blue part. Now, mm -hmm. that actually gets at a very abstract principle of logic, the idea of identity and non-contradiction. Things are the way they are, and they aren't mm -hmm. the way they aren't. So in right. that sense, I do consider that kind of universal. That's true for everything. It is the way it is, and it isn't the way it isn't. Not, it doesn't get you particularly far. It doesn't get you a religion, mm -hmm. but I do think that is something that is universal. Mm -hmm. mm. See, so this is also why I think those, in fact, I, I knew a lady back in the day who uh, very much didn't like the idea of objective truth and its implications. And so in the reasoning process, there was a, there was a worry about any line of reasoning which would result in that particular conclusion. Um, you know, I think that I can, I think that's what's happening here. And, and it would be, it would be interesting to maybe even to watch this for myself um, from the standpoint of thinking that perhaps, perhaps it's, it's an ethical objection to the notion of the existence of objective truth because the existence of objective truth implies uh, eventual group conflict. And that, and that might be true. 
Okay. So what, um, what is your, um, <clears throat> act of love offering me? Like what, am, what will I get from this? If I, if I were to believe you, agree with you. Uh, I think that you would get a, a new belief in the existence of some very limited form of truth. Right. I just, it's just popping in my head, right? It's hard. I, I don't know. So it, it's hard for me not to feel like this is di disingenuous method of reasoning to have one say, well, what, where are we going? What am I going to get from this? What is the value I gain from this? Um, on the one hand, maybe it's good to have that perspective, like going into a conversation, hey, what am I going to gain from this? On the other hand, uh, it doesn't feel genuine. It, it feels like yeah, I'll, I'll believe your conclusions if they help me. All right, so I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit. We had a, a few minutes diversion of just, again, going back to my motivation um, and why I, why I want to have this conversation when I'm trying to get out of it. Is that the case that, that, that there is at least some acknowledgement or like, okay, yes, you can't, you don't have to take a religion, but consciousness is happening however it is happening. Oh, I didn't acknowledge it. I was just saying oh, okay. that's, what okay. that's what you're asking for. You got for. my no, hopes that's, up. Okay. No, you're, that's what you're asking for. And I'm not, and I'm, I'm no, no, I'm not asking for anything. I want to know your thoughts. And <laughs> you, if, if I'm wrong, I want to know if I'm wrong and why I'm wrong. That's all. Yeah. And I, I, I've said this for how long? An hour now, hour and a half. You know, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it could be something else. It could be none of the above. I don't, <laughs> but I, but mostly I just don't know what on earth I'm going to get from it. Like, um, so, okay. If, if I were to accept that as a truth yeah. that I have what you call awareness, okay. Consciousness. Um, what particular doors does that open? Mm. Interesting question, right? Right. It, it does not communicate this sincere pursuit of truth. If there is one, right? Not to say, are you pursuing truth? Maybe does, does that presuppose truth exists? Well, not necessarily, right? Are you pursuing honestly whether or not truth might exist, right? And, and uh, to say, well, what do I get from it just does not communicate um, sincerity. Well, for one, uh, you're going to have to go back on the Joe Rogan show and you're going to say, dude, I was converted. There's this guy. I'm now a card carrying truth seeker. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, that's what this is about, Steve. But, you want to get on the Rogan show. Okay. That's what it is. <laughs> no. So okay. uh, honestly, and I, I say from the ethical nihilist standpoint, I'm not pitching anything. I don't really, so from my perspective, because it really was uh, nihilism. When you say, what do I get from it? I think, I don't care. You get whatever you get from it. You adjust your worldview however you need to adjust your no, worldview. But you want, uh, hello, you do want me to think that way, don't you? You, you are trying to convince me of this, aren't you? Uh, to be you honest. You do care. If it were the case that I were wrong, you said, you said it was love. You said it was love. Well, love so so here's what or, the love is. The love okay. is me trying to discover truth myself, and if I discover it, to try to share it with people who care. So if I'm wrong about this, no, I don't want to convince you. I want you to convince me. I want to be in your. I, I want to be. I want to discover that maybe it's all wrong. If it's all wrong, so isn't it interesting? I think there's a a identification here thinking that, or perhaps pattern recognition, that just like the evangelicals believe that they have truth and want to convert others, if one believes that you have truth of any sort and wish to convert others and talk to them about it, you're trying to convert them to a religion, essentially. I think that's, I think that's again, the kind of knee-jerk, let's not do anything that could be remotely constructed as um, religious, which makes me wonder, which makes me wonder, maybe... I've seen this before. I've seen this before uh, with people that really, really try to insist they aren't something that they are. It's like, uh, it's like you know, sometimes the most passionate and enthusiastic and like, like anti-homosexual people are like closet gays. I wonder if Thaddeus here is religious. Or, or, or I wonder if the intensity of the passion of the denial corresponds to um, being seduced by the allures of religion. And if that's the case, that's okay. 
uh, if you're watching Thaddeus, I accept you. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay to feel, have, to have those feelings. <laughs> uh, but, but for real, um, cause I don't think this level of rejecting anything that could remotely give the appearance of religion is normal. I think it points to some, to something else. And it's cool. Like, like something I found in my own personal journey, like when I, so I was, I was raised evangelical and fell away from that. And then this is kind of the normal story, right? And then, then uh, thought all religious people were stupid, wanted nothing to do with it because it seemed anti-intellectual and kind of devoted my life to, to the use of reason. And then, then had experiences where I kind of came back around to some religious conclusions. Love is so profound to me that it, I, had some kind of at least implicit religion built around um, the importance, the transcendentalness, the divinity, you, if you want to use those words, of love. Um, so, so I wonder if like under the surface, uh, Thaddeus sees some of that and maybe wants some of that and is like secretly persuaded by some of that, but, uh, but it was maybe in, in the closet about it. I don't know. It's an interesting theory. So yeah. my, my goal is actually genuinely to discover truth if it's out there. And I think it is, which is why we're, you know, I gave, I went through the examples that convinced me to see if they would convince you as well. Okay. Let me tell you about my happiness. Yeah. Um, so I have been happier since I chose to orient myself toward the world as an agnostic. Hmm. Um, it, it grants me the feeling that I have is one that I would call freedom. Mm -hmm. um, I feel freer than before. Mm -hmm. uh, for the reason I was sort of describing in the jungles of Peru with the missionary and the Indian who's trying to, who they're trying to convert, you know, um, I don't, I no longer have a mission to convince you of one thing or another. Right. All I am doing really, and this is what Foucault says he was doing, I think, um, is trying to stop people or at least get in their way of trying to convert us. Mm. Right. Because that's really all he's doing. Mm. He's not, he's not saying this doesn't exist. He's just saying, look, dude, you're claiming that, you know, because I have a penis, I'm a man and this means X, Y, and Z and because I'm a homosexual, therefore I'm a natural, blah, blah, blah. You're making truth claims about me and my body and what I should do mm. and where I should be. And maybe you might even want to put me in prison because of that. Right. And so all I'm going to do to you is say, oh, here's your here's this category, man, you know, and here's the history of it. And I can show you how it changes over time, radically over space, places. People have thought about it really differently over time and it keeps getting added to and blah, blah, blah. So you know what? It's historical. It's contingent. It's created by human beings. And therefore, your claim about the essence, the natural essence of my body is bullshit. It's, it's, it's historically contingent. There is nothing in nature or God, you know, where it's rooted. See, I, I think, I think it really sums it up rather well that, and I don't, I don't know if Thaddeus would agree with this rephrasing, um, but he might, he may hear me or may not, um, that truth, if it is not personally, um, invigorating, if it doesn't give you freedom, if it doesn't give you happiness, then it's not, it's not worth caring about that. It is that if delusion makes you happier, then delusion is better than truth. Um, and I, it reminds me, it's like that scene in the matrix, right? Where uh, the guy's eating the steak and he's like, oh, I don't really care if this is an illusion. This tastes really good. Um, I think that might be what's, what's going on here. At least that, that's the impression I get from that, um, that claim. I'm very partial to a lot of that, except it sounds like the purpose of communication is different between us or in, between the postmodernist and the non-postmodernist, because my claims are, are, I'm presupposing that there may be objective truth and that if there is, that will be what, uh, what my beliefs will be oriented around because they're right. true. If we say we choose our beliefs based on them giving me power and freedom, then the whole conversation is very different. Right. So then it's like, well, what ideas make me feel better or what ideas make me happier and more uh, more fulfilled with my life? But that's a very different that's a whole different paradigm. So is that what you're saying, that whether or not there is truth is not really relevant because it does. It's not something that's practical for your own life. Uh, 
Yeah. Well, uh, no, I, <clears throat> it's all, it's all tangled together. So, I mean, to me, scientific truth claims are just as valid as moral truth claims. Uh, they all have a history. Um, and you'll see when you do the, when you write the history, when you study the history of all the truth claims, whether they're scientific or moral, you'll find that there is a history, meaning that there is an origin and the origin is in human minds. What, what about logical history though? So let's stop. So, so before we talk about logic, right, there's, there is real value to understanding that scientific paradigms change and moral paradigms change. Um, I think it's really, most people don't understand that. I think Thaddeus does understand that, but, but I think he's taken too far. Scientific paradigms change, therefore there's no truth because claims about the objective nature of reality have changed and people have been wrong. It means there's no way to be right. And what one will notice if you think about it is, uh, uh, the existence, well, I guess it, logical truths are not something that ha have ever changed, nor could they ever change, right? The, the fact of things being the way that they are to the extent people were conscious, the contents of their consciousness, these are, these are truths. These are not, it, it, I'll put it this way. It is not the case that a thousand years from now, people will look back on what's happening and be able to correctly conclude that awareness and experience as I'm experiencing it right now didn't exist, right? That is a, that is a, a kind of a universal claim about the state of our, our present universe is that awareness and experience definitely exist. It ain't a scientific paradigm. It's not a moral paradigm. It's a factual metaphysical claim. I, I'm a, I mean, I'm a radical, I got a radical mm -hmm. worldview, but mm -hmm. there are logical truths dating back, you know, we're talking pre pre Aristotle about the law of identity and non-contradiction that really haven't changed. Um, no, logic is a language. It's just like English. It's a language with its own internal structure. It's self-referential. It's a closed system. So sure, one plus one equals two within logic, within mathematics. But does that mean that that has some connection to an objective truth outside of mathematics or logic? Logic is a language if you state that it's a language. So this, if I remember correctly, is that I think I might skip because we have an... Uh, uh, a long aside about the nature of logic. So I think it comes down to you know, people to use different words, different ways. The truths that logical discussion point at are universal and have been written about uh, unchanging since pre Aristotle, the law, namely the law of identity and non-contradiction. Things are the way that they are, and they are not the way that they are not. This is not something that gets revised every few centuries as the scientific paradigm changes or the moral paradigm changes. It's a kind of universal one, but I'm going to skip ahead. So we don't just, uh, rehash some linguistic uh, disagreement. <laughs> it sounded like you were saying that because they all agreed on it, it must be true. No, no, or no. It is. I, I only brought okay. that up because okay. you were talking about ideas being radically revised, scientific mm -hmm. ideas being radically revised, cultural ideas being radically revised, and I'm in total agreement. But it is, So if it's the case that there are objectively discoverable truths that are abstract and maybe at the fundamental logical level, what you would expect to see is precisely what has happened, that everybody disagrees and revises about all of the contingent theories about how the natural world works or whether it exists. Right. The thing that everybody agrees on is the thing that is actually discoverable just by meditating on your experience that things are the way they, that they are. Oh, it's the introspection that gets us to the truth. Uh, if it's the case, uh, well, yes, of course. So for those who don't know, uh, to say, oh, it's the introspection that gets us to the truth is another uh, only anti-religious claim. Um, that's all that it serves. So there's, there's this idea, because it's not just religion, but it depends on how you might categorize religion. There's this idea that, oh, in religions, there's, you know, introspection and you know, revelation, that these are kind of uh, non-sophisticated ways of understanding the truth. And, and well, my response is, the only way to understand truth is by introspection or meditating on the meaning of things and meditating on your own experience. Um, so that's just another thing of, oh, so it's introspection or it's revelation or we're going to, it's, it's one of these words that's associated with religion. If it's the case that the truth is that there's experience taking place, then all, you have to introspect in order to understand that experience is taking place. So you're a Platonist in this way? Uh, I, I, if I don't think so, I mean, I don't, I don't exactly know how that category would well, that's, apply. But. Well, that's how that's how he arrived at the truth, right? Was by thinking about, you know, just thinking. That's what he was about. And rather than Aristotle, who was like, no, go out into the world and study stuff and observe things and measure. I, I don't think that would be a fair 
position to summarize. Uh, I mean, maybe you could call it Platonism. I don't. I don't get that. I mean, I, I'm not a Platonist. I'm like a definitely not a Platonist in my metaphor. So, from my understanding of Plato and Aristotle, Plato and Aristotle, you know, Aristotle would not have disagreed that some truths are available to one upon introspection, as namely the the laws of logic, identity, uh, non contradiction, and he said the excluded middle. Um, but to the extent that Aristotle and Plato covered the law of identity, they agree that things are the way that they are. And, and uh, in, um, I forget the, there's a Muslim philosopher, early, early philosopher, who, who was talking about the law of identity. And he said, anybody that claims um, that there's not, that contradictions are possible should mm -hmm. be beaten and burned. Mm -hmm. And to mm -hmm. the point until they admit that to be beaten and burned is not the same as to not be beaten and burned. Right. In other words, yeah. that contradictions aren't possible. No, no, no. I was getting at um, Patterson's pursuit, like what it is and what am I right? That it is it presupposes um, that introspection, looking inward, thinking inward uh, is the is the general direction toward which truth will be uh, ascertained. I don't like the term introspection because it, 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 it comes with a bunch of philosophical baggage. I would say that there is some truth you could... Uh, and also, uh, to say inward implies a metaphysics of inward and outward, right? right. So to commit oneself to say look, look inside is to say there is a difference between inside and outside, which I think you can make a reasonable claim that there is a difference, but uh, you don't have to, and it requires other philosophical argumentation discover by being aware of what you're experiencing. But that's what you're trying to get me to do, though, right? Look inward and, and think about no, my own no, consciousness. Inward. Just look. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, inward. but, but in, look inside myself, right? No, or look. just look. look. So, so <laughs> I like that. I should write that down. So the, actually, that is the claim. Don't look inside. That impl implies something. Just look. Just be aware of what is. And, and, and in the future, if you come to a particular metaphysical theory in which you think there are internal experiences and an external reality, great. But that's step two. Step one is just look. I don't, <laughs> that implies there is a self and all that. Just look, yeah, just yeah, be yeah. aware of what is happening. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so, but it's about my awareness and my awareness alone. Yeah, I would say yeah. that, that because that's what you have direct access to. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, and... Uh huh. And so, but you want to you you so you want to say that there's something universal about that? No. Oh well, kind of, kind of. In the most limited of sense, it uh -huh. is the case that there is experience of a certain nature taking place, which means I have this amazing ability to take a a personal truth or like a conscious <laughs> experiential truth and turn it into something that's objective. So I can say something. Well, of all the things that exist in the world, at least one experience of blue right. is taking place. So mm -hmm. now, it, so if for anybody that were to claim anywhere in the world at any time that blueness is not taking place, I could say you're actually objectively wrong because blueness is taking place. Mm -hmm. So that kind of it's turns the subjective into the objective. Meaning, meaning it's taking place in your consciousness. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So you can't, right. Well, okay. and taking place in my consciousness, and my consciousness is something that exists. So if somebody's making a claim about things that exist in the world, at least my consciousness exists in the world. Oh. Oh. Well, this that sounds right there like you and I might actually be converging, maybe. I don't think we really are, but at least, at least that sentence or a couple of sentences right there take in an isolation converge with my own thinking. Okay. So so I think if I, if I could speak for Thaddeus, I think the idea that okay, we are all having our own individual experiences he likes, but he doesn't like part two. Part two is uh, not only we're, ha we're all having our own individual experiences and they differ, but you step back and say, it is true that we are all having our own individual experiences and that they differ. So the one is kind of a claim within our own mind. Oh, the redness over here is happening. Another is a universal claim. It goes what I call the objectivity of subjectivity, inescapable. It is the case that of all the things that exist, the contents of my experience uh, are, are actually happening. And how do I know what's objective? Because if anybody were to claim otherwise, I know they would be wrong. Right? So if there's any other person that says experience is not happening, blueness is not something that's taking place in anybody's visual field, he's wrong. I'm certain that he's wrong. He's making a claim about the status of the entire, the, the universal whole. And he's wrong in that claim, which must mean that my, my mind has some limited access, limited access to universal truths. 
Because which, which is which is it? Which is this? Leave me alone, right? Because that's 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 <laughs> my that's my whole mission, right? It's like, hey, you want to make all the all you Christians, all you Americans, all you you know absolutists of all sorts, right? You make all these claims about me and my consciousness and who I am and all, everything about me, right? What my skin color means, what my penis means, like everything about me, right? Means all these. How do you, first of all, how do you know? Second of all, um, you're going to, all you're trying to do is manipulate me and try, I know you're not trying to do this, but that's, you know, um, that was, a, that was an interesting quote. All you're trying to do is, manip is manipulate me, but you might not be trying to do that. Well, am I or am I not? I mean, that's actually important. Have you found somebody that isn't trying to manipulate you? I mean, that would seem like it's a big deal. Maybe there are a few of those out there. Um, but again, I do, as, as, as deeply as I disagree with the philosophical claims, I do think there's some goodness here. There are, it comes maybe from some place of goodness where... Thaddeus does not want to restrict you and your freedom and put you in any box whatsoever based on his perception of you and based on his theories of you, right? I think that's cool. Um, I just think it gets taken too far. I think, I think the desire to live in a world in which there is no nature and therefore absolute freedom is so great and so strong that it, uh, if it, it, it's, so, it's such a beautiful, almost like a religious claim itself, that it destroys everything else in the in the process it's like this vision is so beautiful and good and helps people flourish that we're going to destroy everything else in order for that vision to be true in order for that vision to be true or correct or the one that everybody holds we have to annihilate the concept of like a real objective nature in general which is funny it just it just adds a, a little bit more evidence to my theory that actually thaddeus is religious and that, which is okay, right? It's just okay. Everybody has their own type of like religious things they're bringing to the table. And I think this is, uh, I think, uh, what's the, that Shakespeare quote? Me thinks the, the lady doth protest too much. I think that's going on with uh, that is here. Uh, so when you say that, that when someone makes a claim that that pen is not blue, to you, your answer is, yes, it is. It's blue to me. And that's my truth. Kind of. Well, that's the way that, that you would phrase it. I would say so, you're objectively wrong. If you're making a claim. Right, right, right. So, so that's so important. To me, my truth is that this is black. This, to see how different, see, this is very, this is critically important, right? It's one thing to say my truth is that it's black and your truth is that it's blue, right? The objectivist, the, the Randian objectivist says it is the case that it is black. No, no, that's silly. I think the correct correct answer solution here is a middle ground. It is true that in my visual field it is black, and if you're claiming the contrary, you are wrong, right? It is true, objectively, that in my visual field it is black. This is, an, this is an objective claim about something that's taking place in the universe. This is not just purely a statement of preference. This is not a purely sub subjective thing. This is not my truth. I am stating an objective universal claim, which is right or wrong, depending on whether you agree or deny, uh, deny it. That there are no such things as experiences of looking into a computer right now. I'd say you're wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm certain mm -hmm. that there are such things that exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you become... <laughs> Yeah, you become a you become an imperialist like right away. You flip it right no, immediately and start making claims about others. It's not imperialism. I'm just <laughs> state. See, I think that's fun. I can't tell if that's a joke or not. I mean, it's funny that you become an imperialist right away, but this is the same. This is the same thing that keeps coming up. It's like uh, this this incredible aversion to a particular set of conclusions, uh, regardless of the collateral damage of uh, of of the rest of the philosophy it's like well, we can't we cannot be imperialist we cannot be religious we cannot be like the christians therefore we must take all contrary propositions what is the case if somebody is claiming that my mind is not experiencing what my mind is experiencing they're wrong no but you're making claims about my mind and what it's experiencing right now aren't you or no no I don't, I don't know oh i don't know oh. I, I don't know that any other that there's any other mind out there okay i can't know that so you're an agnostic on me? Uh, if it's the, I'm an agnostic as to whether or not uh, there is another type of consciousness like my own. I have a positive belief that there are lots of them, 
because if I were to go, if I were to have the experience of poking you, I think you would mm -hmm. say, ow, which means makes me think, okay, maybe this is another conscious being, but I don't claim any kind of certain knowledge about it. All right. Well, I'm, I like that too. So what, um, <laughs> but if, and if I said that pen in your hand is red, you would say what? I, well, I would say if, if you're having the conscious experience of seeing red, then it is, if we speak the same language, we're having different conscious experiences. If your claim, however, is that it is red in my visual field, I would say you're making an objectively wrong claim right. about the nature of the world because yeah, see, the blue experience okay. is what's taking place. Right. This is where I get, okay, so it sounds to me like you're, sometimes it sounds like your truth claims are universal and sometimes it sounds like they're particularistic. So I, I call it the universe, the uh, objectivity of subjectivity that I can oh. make, I can say subjectively true things. I am experiencing blue, but I can make them objective very easily. The blue experience is part of what exists in the world. Let me give you another example. To me, this pin is black. Thaddeus would probably like that claim. To me, this pin is black. Now, you can interpret that through the subjectivist lens or the non-subjectivist lens. You can interpret the claim, this, to me, this pen is black, as some relativistic claim. You can also take the exact same words and make them objectively in, uh, true and universal. To, it is true that, to me, this pen is black, right? It's one thing I'm saying it from my mind. It's like a preference for, imagine we're talking about music. Like, jazz music is the best type of music. It's like a subjective truth. But imagine I say, to me, jazz music is the best type of music. Is that a subjective claim? How about if I phrase it this way? In the universe, there is at least one mind which evaluates jazz music as the best type of music. That is a universal claim that I have direct access to. Jazz is, by the way, not the best type of music. And maybe the oh. only part, I don't know. Because you, okay, because you perceive it that way. Because you... Yeah, right? And we're talking about oh. my perception. Yeah, so if you leave it at that, we're good. We're good, I think. I, I just sounded many times like you weren't leaving it at that, and I got re really nervous. But uh, yeah, no, sure. I, I don't, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't use terms like objective and truth. So what, uh, what if that, I were to say Thad is not having the experience of looking into a computer right now? <laughs> Oh, um, I would say, uh, well, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I would just oh, yeah. see, 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 I think, I think again, what he, he asked himself, what would I say? I think the word choice of, I don't know is like, it, it's almost really, this is, this is crazy. This is the same thing that happens when talking with, uh, evangelicals. I have many, 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 many hours talking with evangelicals, arguing with them. And their answer to some philosophical questions is, is almost as if they read off a script. It's like, oh, I guess I believe this. And well, what about why? Well, I guess in order to be consistent with everything else that I believe, I must believe why. And, and it's not, it's not serious. It's, it's like, I guess this, I guess this is what I would say in order to keep the whole thing together. You don't know whether or not you're having the experience of looking into a computer screen. Hmm. I, I, that's so, what I think that you yeah. can know, though. But imagine you were actually <laughs> having that experience that you described that way. Somebody can be wrong about that. No, I can prove that. I don't know. I don't know how you can prove any of this stuff. You don't like, have to prove it. You just know it. It's like it's just, I, a, that's just religious belief, you Christian. It's, it's not really. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. That's what it is. That's there. There it is. In a nutshell, if what you say is true, that the mind has access to objective and universal truth, then that is a religious claim, you Christian. And and really, really, uh, that is not the most ridiculous thing to say. Okay, because I it, there is something deeply, deeply, deeply profound about believing that one has access to universal truth. And I think inescapably the mind does have access to the universal truth. And there are, uh, many people have attempted to answer the question of how we could have access to objective and universal truth by positing something like a God mind, a universal mind that you partake in. Like that is not, it is not 
too far away from a religious claim. It's not hard to see how religious thinkers um, would arrive at their conclusions. So I say that on the one hand. Um, on the other hand, I think it's just a demonstration that um, any religious claims are to be avoided at all costs, even if, even if they're right there and like they're self-evident, my experience is the way that it is. Well, how could it be? If it were that way, then I'd have to be a Christian, right? It's like, well, you got to go where the argument leads. It's not religious to say that my experience is of a nature that I know the nature that it is, and I describe it with the word blue. And if you use the word red, that means something different to me in my language, and it is certainly not the case that the experience is red. I know it. This is why I say it's a big deal, because that then that immediately gets you to the laws of logic. It is the way that it is, and it isn't the way that it isn't. And suddenly, yeah, we're all Christians now. <laughs> Let me let me leave you with something. <laughs> okay, you may have come across this. Um, do you know what Nietzsche said about the writing of philosophy? Uh, in a concrete sense, like a quote or the general yeah. idea? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't. He said that all philosophy is biography. Okay, mm. I like that. I like that. <laughs> so. I don't know. I just, I'm very, I'm taken with this, your narrative of, um, I, I don't even know exactly what's going on. I'm not trying to say, you know, this explains you or your ideas in any particular way. Um, but I'm just taken. I love this, that you, that you have a narrative about it, about the pursuit, uh, Patterson's pursuit, uh, which or Patterson in pursuit, which is that, you know, it kind of began with this sort of general vague idea about there being a truth and that you liked that you were attracted to it. You Maybe thought, that if it's the case, I yeah. want to know about it. And if it's yeah, not you, the case, but, I don't, I don't, I want to live my life in a way that is like, Oh, there's no such thing as objective truth. Yeah. You, know? you were attracted to it. You were moving. So you decided to move forward toward it, toward it. Right. And then, and then along comes this woman and then you fall in love, and then you, in that experience, you feel like you have discovered a truth about yourself that you didn't know previously. Yeah. And then that became much more specifically your pursuit in a way, and you also wanted to give other people access to this thing that might possibly, might possibly uh, help them and um, in various ways, and so that's why you're doing this. And so I just think that that's, um, I think that's really interesting, and I like it. Thanks. I don't know. Thanks. That's, I mean, did, that, that's <laughs> a fair summary. I, I would say, though, okay. just as an addendum, I do find truth far more important than the, the specifics of love. So oh, sure. I'm no, I get claiming it. I yeah. might be wrong about love being important. And it may, 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 may very well be totally yeah. a, a hallucination. It may just I have a brain structure that's susceptible to serotonin in a way. But I wouldn't say that about truth. Whatever the truth is, is more. If I get unplugged from the matrix, what happened? I'd be like, okay, that's more important. I don't know though. See, cause you're saying, I, I see what you, so on one level, the overarching mission is the truth, Indeed. right? Okay, cool. But the fact that the love experience confirmed your belief in truth and seemingly accelerated your pursuit oh, of truth. No, but the love experience didn't confirm my belief in truth. <laughs> I had already, logic is the thing that, con, that, that convinced oh. me truth. As, as real yeah uh -huh. and then it the well, love was totally unexpected and just like oh this is like this did is something for a human mo the most said, important yeah but my hearing what your, your own narrative was that it did something to your pursuit right it did there was a moment okay. that was a turning point it it turned me from a nihilist into whatever i am <laughs> a love person <laughs> but wait so this is uh kind of grody uh, I don't like that, you know, the summarization of everything. There's this quote from Nietzsche, <laughs> not so subtle. Oh, philosophy is really just biography. I think that's interesting. Okay. So I, I think the, the message there is, eh, you just playing a game. All this is just kind of an exercise in vanity. And yeah, you had this love experience. I never communicated this, but he seems to think that my belief in truth has something to do with my experience of love. That's certainly not the case. Absolutely not. Uh, my belief in truth is com completely separate of my experience of love and my belief in love. I might be mistaken about the existence of love and its profundity. I'm not mistaken about the existence of truth um, for the reasons that I laid out 
in this. So I find it very uh, condescending, frankly, condescending and uh, to kind of pat one on the head and, and say, well, I'm not going to actually engage with your arguments, but I'll kind of distantly mock them and, and see what's going on as you're just on this pursuit as a, as a young child. And uh, oh, that's an interesting fact. Not a fan. Alice does not believe in truth, right? Right. So I say it an ethical nihilist. An ethical nihilist thinks that there that truth uh, that uh, there is no such thing as like objectively true morality, or that statements about morality don't really have meaning to them. Or technically, oh. I might be an emotivist, uh, an emotivist, which is like their statements of preference. I think that is the case. Except now I have this love experience. Is like okay, this is actually meaningful. Here's here's the meaning. This is what human life can be oriented around, at least my human life. And so that's why mm -hmm. it changed me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and when I asked you, why are you doing this right now, talking to me this way, you said one word, love. love. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, all right. So I, I think... Um, it's a, it's a, it's a two-pronged approach. <laughs> for the intellectuals yeah. who just want to know about truth, great. I'm happy to share it. But for yeah. those those crazy people that will follow these conclusions wherever they lead, well, they might have a love experience, in which case I, you know, I would feel pretty good about that. I just want you to think about that. Biography, philosophy. And also one last thing. Yeah. Um, you know, for Foucault, <sighs> discourse, all all power is discourse, number one. And then number two, he says that um discourse power does not go from top to bottom or even from the bottom to the top of a society. It circulates, it goes laterally, it goes up and down, sideways, backwards, diagonally, it goes all the way, it's constantly circulating, right? So that ideas, discourse, concepts, categories, words, claims, truth claims, the color blue, the idea of the color blue, the idea of pens, the idea of Steve, of Thad, of all these, they're circulating, they have no, they have no origin, right? There's no, you can't sort of, you can't identify a, a, an origin, a genesis moment to be more um, apt here. Now that's correct. I don't know if that's Foucault's claims or Derrida or whoever he brought up, but that would just be wrong, right? That, that's the critical error is that there's no origin of meaning and there is origin in every single individual, every word that they speak, the origin is uh, the meaning inside of their mind. A genesis, right, inside of a person or anywhere, anywhere, either in the Bible or in nature in a person, that it's just all you can see is just these con all these things circulating between people, among people and back and forth. You say this, I I hear the thing and then I make it into my own concept and I give it back to you. Then it goes back and forth and it goes to your wife and then it goes to my girlfriend that goes all around the world. Um, I, you know. All those, all those things uh, circulating in your own, what you think of as your consciousness, he would say, began elsewhere. Uh, maybe, but one of the benefits of being somewhat antisocial is that uh, like three quarters of that story doesn't apply to me. <laughs> hey, like, all... <laughs> I'm on my own pursuit. I don't really... I, 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 I'm fortunate to have discovered the love meth crack. That is like the best thing ever. And mm. if I'd persuade people or don't, it's not as important as me discovering truth myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> but All right. I have kept you much longer than uh, yeah. <laughs> we agreed to. This has been a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank Both you. parts, the love and the, and the truth conversation. So that was great. All right. Thank you, man. This was fun. So, I guess in conclusion, uh, I think that there's a, another turn here where there is an attempt to explain the philosopher rather than engage with the ideas. Um, and I don't th think that's good. Um, I, think, I think that results in confusion. I don't think it's honest. Um, I value honesty and uh, trying to engage ideas separate from the speaker of the ideas. And uh, I do think that a lot of these ideas come from maybe the desire not to harm anybody and not to force them into a particular box, a particular conceptual system that exists in your mind. I think that's admirable. Um, I, um, I think that that desire has created a, a rather extreme um, allergy to anything remotely sounding religious. Um, I think, uh, I think it might be that 
were Thaddeus to introspect inside himself, he might he might find a little religious person as well. I, I guess you could you could also interpret the intensity of the conclusion, uh, the determinedness of the conclusions um, about not knowing whether or not experience is taking place um, as a type of uh, religious thinking. Um, that's the way that I would put it. Is that if somebody's being honest and somebody's you know sincerely reporting their experiences and their thought process, and they don't already have a conclusion in mind, I don't think you wind up with the postmodern theory of truth, to be honest. I don't think you do. Um, but that's my thoughts. I'd love to know what you guys think. Um, I very much enjoyed both of my conversations with Thaddeus. I hope to speak with him more in the future, either on my show or on his show. Um, yeah, I think... Uh, I think this has been valuable for me just to listen to it again. I feel like I understand postmodernism a little bit more now. And I, I hope the arguments that I made for the existence of uh, external truth and the, uh, the connection that we have to objective truth um, are compelling. Um, if they're not, if you think there's a flaw, please leave a comment. Let me know. I'm very interested in if I'm wrong. I'd like to know that I'm wrong, um, though I have the suspicion not being persuaded that consciousness isn't taking place, but I'm, I'm ready to hear the arguments. Um, all right. Thanks for listening, guys, and I'll talk to you again in a couple weeks.